So it's Christmas time. We're telling the Christmas story. Amen? Amen. Um, we have gone through the genealogies, both in Matthew and in Luke. Uh, we talked about Simeon the other day in Luke. If you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and read, and then we're going to talk a little bit about Jesus Christ, the star of Bethlehem, even so, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And we're going to talk a little bit about what kind of signs and wonders you may be looking for today. Amen? So let me put my peepers on, and then we'll get into it. Ready, set, Luke chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 29 in reference and context to this man, Simeon, uh, up in age, who had been told by God himself that he would not die until he saw the consolation of Israel, a title, if you will, in reference to the Messiah. He says, uh, Simeon, verse 28, took him, Jesus, up in his arms, and he blessed him. And he, and he blessed God and said, Lord, uh, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to to thy word. Obviously, again, he had been told by God. But now, there's another way to interpret this as well, that he had read the scriptures, for the scriptures foretold the coming of Christ. But he says, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. One of the things that we determined Wednesday night is that salvation is not a thing. Salvation is not a system. Salvation is not a paycheck or some sort of entitlement. Salvation is a person. Salvation is a person, and it came in the person of Jesus Christ in the form of an infant. He says, For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which has prepared, before the, which has, has prepared for the face of all people, a light, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mo mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed him, blessed them, and said unto Mary, uh, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and the rising of again uh, of many, which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. This is a reference to uh, Mary's grief at the crucifixion of her son, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Yes, uh, even at the crucifixion, the disciples did scatter, and it was the majority of the people that called for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Let's park there for two seconds. Hey, you know I've never been into majority rule. Never really been into that. Mostly because if you look at majority rule in the biblical context, the majority is wrong almost every time. See? I mean, you, you, uh, they sent uh, ten spies to spy out the land. Yeah, eight of them said, no, we can't go in there. There'd be giants in there. We're grasshoppers in their sight. Two said, hey, God said it's ours. Let's go take what's ours. Well, because of the, the naysayers, the scared ones, you know, the scaredy cats, uh, they spent 40 years in the wilderness. Why? Well, the majority ruled. No, I'm into the faithful few. Amen or on me? Yes, but it goes on to say, And there was one, Anna, a prophetess. Now, we're going to talk about her for a second before we move on. There was a one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, uh, of the tribe of Asher. Now, one of the things I talked about a couple uh, in the first couple messages was that the genealogy in Matthew and the genealogy in Luke, both one definitely in Matthew considered uh, the genealogy of, of Joseph. The one in Luke considered the genealogy of Mary. There's some debate in that. I have a personal conviction it's of Mary because this way there could be no doubt that Jesus Christ, right, was the rightful heir to the throne of David, the king of the Jews. And being born of a virgin, not only did Jesus fulfill that scripture and that prophecy, but he now can become the sinless sacrifice, as he did, and is the king of kings and the lord of lords. 
Yes, but here we, what we see is, is this, is that, what was the point I was trying to make, Austin? Oh, Asher, Asher. Uh, this woman, Asher, she, she was of the tribe of Asher. Uh, those two genealogies are the only genealogies we have intact from 70 A.D. on. Widely known and widely accepted. After 70 A.D., it's not that ten tribes went missing. It is all of the records and the genealogies of those ten tribes went missing. But you see here, uh, Anna knew where she came from. Just like you all mostly know, the household you grew up in, the, the, your mother and father, if not both, then one or the other, or possibly even your adoptive parents. She knew. And you know what else? God knows. Do you know God knows where every, every uh, Jew is in the world right now? Uh, just as he knows every hair on our head. And are you ready for this one? I know this is going to freak you out. Because CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News, they have not been keyed in on this. He even knows the day of your death. He knew the day of your demise before you were knit in the womb. The beginning from the end. He said, oh, I'm not so sure about that. Well, I'll tell you what I know. Your God's awful small. My God's omnipotent. He knows everything. You think you could die a day too early? Day too late? Without God's notice? No. He knows. We trust in the Lord. And what does he do? Well, he directs our steps. Well, it says in verse 30, uh, uh, later on in verse 36, she was of great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. So she married him young, uh, and she was a widow of about four score and 84 years. Uh, this puts her, according to most biblical scholars, about 84 years old. And this one, this one here, she, she's lived past the uh, life expectancy of, uh, twice past the life expectancy of most people during that age. That's not because people didn't live to 84, but because most people didn't make it out of infancy in those days. But here she's 84, and she was told or knew of the coming of Messiah. And at 84, uh, it says, which departed not from the temple. She didn't depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayer night and day. And she, coming in that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord. When she saw Jesus, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for the redemption of Israel. This is interesting to me. I guess she could have been likened to uh, what used to be called an evangelical. Remember evangelicals? Those people, those people of old who would spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, you may find yourself in one of those antiquated uh, terms now. I consider myself an evangelical. Paul tells Timothy, even so, go forth and do the work of an evangelist. Yes. Edify the saints. Yes. Yes, build up the body, yes, but do the work of an evangelist. Tell people about Jesus. Tell people far and wide, near and close, that Jesus Christ was born. Born to do what? Born to live a sinless life and become a sacrifice for sins. But not lay in a grave, but rise again on the third day, conquering death and sin. I get one amen out of that? Come on now. Conquering both death and sin. Woo! Okay, thank you, Austin. I'm going to look at you from now. I'm just going to preach to you. Austin, <laughs> did you know that Jesus has risen, Austin? Yes. Okay, I'm glad. Amen. Yeah, well, she sounds like a modern evangelical. I, you know, all it takes is one person to even think that somebody's sick. And within 30 minutes, 300 people know about it, too. I spoke with a couple this last week. One of the two told me their conversion story. I won't mention names because I don't want them to think like most people do that I come up and preach people's lives. But this is too good not to share. This person says she was sitting down to eat at a buffet in a casino of all places. Jesus is there. Listen, my friends, you can find Christ in a bathroom, you know. Uh, just don't stay there. That would be kind of gross. <laughs> she began to talk with a Christian friend. 
The Christian friend, and I'm paraphrasing for time's sake. The Christian friend said, and I hope I'm getting this right. Oh, honey, you need Jesus. Let us pray. They prayed. She received Jesus Christ at that buffet. This woman said, Pastor, I couldn't help myself. I got up. And she said, the people all around us were crying and praising God. I said, at the buffet. She says, yes. And she says, on the way out, I told everybody, I've been redeemed. I know Jesus Christ. It sounds like Anna to me. Why? Well, I guess she wanted to share some good news. I've got good news for you, folks. The Christ that saved that woman in that casino is the same Christ today. The same Christ that came and showed his light unto the Gentiles, which all of us are, by the way, uh, is here today. And his light can shine brightly in your life. All you need to do is confess your sins to him. Not to me. I'm a sinful man. I can't absolve you of your sins. There's nothing you can do or I could do to absolve you of your sins. Jesus Christ did it all. Hence, on the cross, you know what he said? It is finished. Ooh, I love those three words. You know, other than free buffet now. Those, I mean, those are second, but it is finished. Oh, now I've got food on the mind. Yes, Anna heard something. Simeon heard something. They heard and they told. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Let us go back now. We have already seen the Christ child after his birth being brought before, presented according to the law in the temple. Simeon, who served there, uh, receiving the two turtle doves and the pigeons. Sin offerings, by the way, on behalf of Joseph and Mary, not Jesus. Jesus never sinned. There was, uh, babies don't sin, for one. Baby, uh, most babies are born in sin. Why? Well, they inherit it from their father. Moms, I guess you're off the hook. Ah, but you inherited it from your father, so relax for a second. Ah, but see, Jesus, having a heavenly father, being manifest in the womb of a virgin, never knowing the touch of a man, was born perfect without sin. We are born with a penchant towards sin because of the fall. But babies aren't held accountable for sin. Why? There's no conscious choice. Hence, by the way, also why your infant baptism doesn't count. Just putting it out there, folks. I know that you think I'm bashing religions. I'm trying to illuminate truth to you. God wants your personal choice and obedience, not something somebody else did for you when you had no choice. Well, here in Matthew chapter 2, we see the wise men. You say, oh, those three wise men? There's no three wise men. There's probably 300 men. But we think there's three wise men. Why? Because they brought three gifts. That's a whole other story. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, the king beheld, uh, the king, Herod the king, behold, there came wise men, see it doesn't say three, it just says wise men, uh, from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. His star, what do stars do? They shine, don't they? They shine. Well, yeah, he said, we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. You know that's why I've come here today? I have come here to worship him. He is worthy. And Herod the king, uh, when he had heard this, these things, uh, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Why? Well, you know why? Because if there was a king, Herod was an imposter for one. And if Herod was an imposter, guess what? All of the political connivings and falsehoods and lies that they had built one upon another over Herod's rule would come tumbling down. Well, that's enough to scare any politician. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of all the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, at least they knew their Bible. 
He said unto them, he said unto him, in, they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor, and he shall rule my people Israel. Referencing Malachi 5.2, I believe. Goes on to say, then Herod, when he had heard privily, called the wise men. He called these wise men back and inquired of them diligently, what time did the star appear? And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when, when you find him, bring me word again and I may come worship him. Now we all know that Herod had ill in his heart, right? We know that. But at least he did send them on the right path. And when they, the wise men, heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star that shines, what? Shines light, which they had saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over the young, where the young child was. This star directed them to the light of the world. Now that's irony for you. In, in a, the darkness of night... God gave a sign in the heavens to direct these wise men to the light of the world. Here's the question. How did they know that that was Jesus' star? Because they had heard what most people don't know, only our real Green Beret biblical Bible uh, scholars in here may know, is that these wise men came from the place where Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were. And they had the Old Testament, at least up until their time. And they knew that out of Judah would come a scepter. Out of Judah would come a star. And they knew that these prophecies... These prophecies were for the Messiah. Not just the king of Israel, but they knew it would, he would be the king of the world, even the prince of heaven. Well, uh, these things were heard, even written down, and these wise men from the area of Babylon had come because they saw Jesus' star in the dark of night leading them to the light of the world. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they came in, into the house, now see, they're not in the manger anymore. See, uh, yesterday, what were we doing? Uh, my grandson and I, we've been trying to post uh, uh, stuff on our Facebook. Uh, Christmas music, day in and day, uh, day out, uh, me and Brother Dave down in Florida. Uh, and even some Christmas cartoons and some just silly cartoons. Because, you know, sometimes things are just funny and sometimes things are just fun. And I like fun. Well, yesterday I found a, a version on YouTube of the little drummer boy. And we were about halfway through the little drummer boy, and my grandson said, Grandpa, where in the Bible is this story? <laughs> and I said, well, Micah, this, this, is what, this is what they call kind of uh, uh, fictional illustration uh, of the Bible. It's something that somebody would thought of in their imagination uh, around the birth of Christ. And I went, hmm. I go, but I'm glad you asked because there is a moral to the story. And see, in Western literature, there used to be morals to stories. Now, it's just fight, 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 fight. I don't know. It's just never-ending pap in almost every story. There's never an arc. There's never a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's just one long whatever. Ah, but he goes, well, what's the moral? I said, the moral is is that Jesus is not looking for your riches. He's looking for you. And when the little boy offered him himself, as the song goes, and he smiled at me, so I played for him. Not in the Bible, but biblical. Does that make sense? Well, it goes on. And it says, And when they came into the house, they saw the young child... Mary, uh, with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshipped him. That is the proper response when you come into the presence of Jesus Christ. To fall down and worship him. 
And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now these treasures, uh, though, though they are not necessarily like what the little drummer boy in that story presented, all speak of his deity, uh, of his sacrifice, his death, and his resurrection. But we're not going to talk about that today. What I want to emphasize is the light. Is the light. Years ago, I don't know if you, if anybody here driven past the marquee and noticed it lately, we've got the, uh, the play out there. And uh, I, I, I stepped into some giant shoes when I became the pastor here. Uh, my, my predecessor, he was about five foot nothing. Although, I tell you what, the man must have weighed a million pounds. He was walking up the stairs once and he fell and I jumped to catch him. I'm like, whoa, man, you're kind of heavy, dude. But, I mean, he would always put something clever out there. And I, I don't think he downloaded them off the internet. So I'm always trying to put something clever out there and, and always falling short. But one day I thought, you know what I'm going to put out there? I'm going to put... Uh, you've been looking for a sign? Here it is. Yeah. You wouldn't believe the nutcases that came out of the woodwork. <laughs> I saw my sign! Can I speak with the pastor? I'm like, whoa! You know, you got to be careful what you put out on that sign. <laughs> How many people have been looking for a sign their whole life? Signs and wonders, Lord! Why have the heavens not opened up? Why has there not been a star for me to follow to the light of the world? I've been in a dark place, God. Why? Because for one thing, that requires little if no faith. Now these people were definitely Gentiles. Pagans. But they had read... And trusted what they read, and when they saw, they went. Do you know what the Bible says? Faith cometh by hearing, and that of the Word of God. I said, well, yeah, I, I believe that. Okay, good. But it says here in this book, hold on a second, what book is that? Oh, it's not the Bible. Well, why don't we just stick with the Bible? Well, you know, because I need this book to understand that book. Hold on. See, that's, ex that's what we call in the biz. Extra biblical. Para, para biblical. I like biblical. I like sound doctrine. So, why is it we don't look for signs and wonders? I'm glad you asked, Austin, because I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Jesus Christ didn't come to abolish the law, he came to fulfill it. Hence, eight days after he was born, he was circumcised. Hence, after he was circumcised and Mary had been ritually cleansed, they went to the temple in accordance to Levitical law, according to the law of Moses, and presented themselves before the Levitical priesthood. They brought their sin offering and made sure that the law was taken care of. Why? Because all of those laws, all the ritualistic and, and the moral laws, some of which we still adhere to today, they were all there as types and foreshadows of the perfect which has come in Jesus Christ, first as a babe. He's not a babe anymore. He's a grown man. He sits at the right hand of the throne of God, and he will return one day. That's what my grandson was reading about. And let me tell you something. That's what I hope my grandson and my granddaughter, when I have been dead for 5, 10, 15 years, hold on to with all of their might, not me, not my faith, not my calling, not my preaching. The Word, the truth, the promise, the book, the blood, the blessed hope. We have nothing else. Ah, why don't we look for signs and wonders today? Because Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Hath in these last days spoken to who? Us. He said, no, no, no. That's the writer speaking to the people he's writing to. Let me tell you something. If you're a Christian, this book is for you. Not just Hebrews, Genesis through Revelation. Don't let anybody fool you. This is a love letter to you. 
that you might know and understand and grow closer to the God who created everything. Ha, who hath in these last days spoken to us by who? The news? The TV? Instagram? He has spoken to us by his son. Jesus is who spoke to me as an eight-year-old boy. He looked a lot like a vacation Bible school worker. Not much past her 20s. But I tell you what, the love that she exuded sharing the gospel to a little lonely boy took root It took root in these times. He speaks to us by his son through his word. The Christian, our spirit communes with God by his spirit. He said, I, I, don't, I don't really know how to talk to him. I got good news for you. His spirit does all the translating, speaking in utterances we could never pronounce. Ah, but see, we have this translator, and we have, we have this one who sits and ever makes intercession on our behalf, who has the ear of the Father, who will give one day, even now, the authority unto Jesus Christ to judge the living and the dead. And he came as a babe. And yes, a star in the night then led the wise men to the light of the world. Wise men still seek him. How about you? He has in these day, last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being in the brightness of his glory. Now, what is bright? Light is bright. Remember light bright? Remember that? Well, that was a great game, but we, we had to get rid of that because I could never get them all up off the floor, and if it ever stuck in my dad's foot, he'd kill me. Who, being in the brightness of his glory... And if you're ever worried about Jesus, that Trinity thing, about Jesus being God in the flesh, read your Bible. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, whose person? God. Express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. By the word of his power. His word is power. And then we shrink from everything because of what? The word of the world. His, world. his word is power. When he had made by himself, purged, when he had, excuse me, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I got three words for you. You ready? Say amen. amen. These are three P words. And it's not payment protection plan. Repeat after me. Paid. Paid. Purged. Purged. Propitiation. Propitiation. Ooh, that's three syllables. He paid the price. He purged us of our sins by becoming the propitiation for them. The substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Merry Christmas. Your eternal life is the greatest gift anyone could ever receive. You need not ever, ever receive anything else if you have that. Fact of the matter is, are you ready for this? This is extra. Hold on to your seats. Get that gift. The only gift that comes close to that is the gift of becoming a giver. You get that gift, now you have something really to give. You have something that you will give, and 41 years later, 
you'll have some boneheaded, high school educated, grocery clerk praising God for you, and I can't even remember her name. Merry Christmas. God is so good. Amen. Don't forget it. Says, this is a dark time. It is only as dark as you think it is. Christ shines brightest in the darkest of times. I will remind you of this and then we will go. At the exact right time, Jesus Christ came out of eternity and invaded this planet. We are in the enemy-occupied territory, folks. He was an alien here as we are pilgrims on a journey here. Why, I said, he was an alien? I thought he's God. He is God. But see, he was an alien in a world that has rebelled against him. And we are an invading force. We should not be a shrinking army. We are an invading force. But the weapons are, are, of our warfare are not violence. The weapons of our warfare are mighty to bring down strongholds in high and wicked places. They are prayer. They are faithfulness. They are devotions. They are meditations unto God. They are the Word of God and claiming the promises of God. And yes, using your head. He's not a baby. He's a grown man. Hebrews says he sits at the right hand of the throne of majesty. Amen? Amen. He's coming back, yes? yes? As a warrior king. Hey, today, tonight, until he calls you home, get on your knees and do some warfare. He said, well, I'm scared. Fine, fight there first. God, even so, help our unbelief. He went to that place, but there he could do no miracles. Because why? Because of his unbelief. I never ask for anything that I don't believe he'll do. Do you believe he will forgive you of your sins? Do you believe that once you've been forgiven of your sins and you've received him as your Lord and Savior, that he'll resurrect you from the dead? then why don't you receive him? 